big, big geologic formation that the Bakken's a part of. Okay, here's Alberta. All right. Here is Edmonton in Alberta. And Edmonton sits right on top of a big light oil, very similar to the Bakken. Okay? And then there's some heavier oil over here. But all of this within this yellow circle is where the oil sands are. 10% of it is bitumen. Bitumen is that asphaltine-like stuff. This is heavy, heavy stuff. So these are uh, different types of, of materials, petroleum materials that come out of Canada. Conventional light crude is about, this is barrels per day, okay? Barrels per day. So we're talking a lot of stuff here. A lot of bitumen coming out, but very little of it coming to be refined to the East Coast. What are the characteristics of this stuff? Well, it's really heavy, heavy, heavy. There are three things you have to do. Remove most of the water, remove most of the solids, and add something that's called a diluent. A diluent makes it flow, okay? Because if you want to put it in a pipeline, if you want to move it around, you got to make it flow. That these pipelines that move this stuff that comes right out of the ground and that, um, that move it to a pipeline terminal, those, those are specialized pipelines. The pipeline here that moves the rest of it around once it's diluted is called a transmission pipeline. And there are specs for what can go through a transmission pipeline. Let me tell you a little bit about the diluents. There are a couple of different diluents, and I'm not going to have time really to go into this tonight, but there can be sin bits, which are basically uh, diluted with a synthetic crude oil, uh, or there are dill bits, which are diluted typically with something called a natural gas condensate. They basically dilute it with what they have available and what's cheap. All right? And the dil dilution is about 30 to 50%, depending on what you're using. So let's think about the properties. A lot of times you hear that this stuff is very corrosive, all right? What makes it corrosive? Naturally occurring organic acids, the water, the sulfur, and the sediments. OK. Now, all pipelines, not only in Canada but in the US, have to have uh, materials that are of low corrosivity. Now, you may or may not like pipeline companies, but they're not stupid. They're not going to ship stuff that's going to corrode their pipelines, right? Because it's going to break down their pipeline, and it's going to cost them money. So there are very, very strict rules about this. And typically, bitumen, it, these are funny little units, but bitumen, let's just look at the units here, is about three, OK? The oil sands materials, once they're uh, dill bit or a sin bit, are about 1.6, and cooking vinegar is about 47. So the acidity is very low. All right? Why? Because they wash this stuff, do a lot of floating, et cetera, to produce the product. So you get a lot of wastewater out of it, but the material itself that's produced is actually of relatively low corrosivity. What about the water content? Okay. By law, pipelines cannot ship anything that has, that everything has to have less than or equal to 0.5% water by volume. All right? When you have an oil wet pipeline, you're not going to get corrosion. But when you have water next to the pipeline, you are going to get corrosion. Where you see corrosion from internal corrosion is usually where there's a dip in the pipeline because the petroleum is lighter. And the water is heavier, so the water sinks down to the bottom of the dip. They get rid of a lot of this sediment. In fact, uh, in a transmission pipeline, by law, you, by regulation, you have to have less than or equal to 0.5% by volume of sediment. All right. So this is just what the transmission pipelines have. So these things are regulated. And, and so that's, that's the reality. I'm not trying to say it's right to do shipping of oil sands products, but these are the realities. So if you want to get at it, don't use these specious arguments. Right? There are a lot of other reasons why you might not want to ship it by pipeline or ship oil sands or produce oil sands. But don't say, oh, it's highly corrosive. It's no more corrosive 
than a sw light sweet crude or than a, a, a sour crude coming out of, of uh, the Bakken formation. Rail cars, we just talked about the rail cars. Uh, the biggest bill was this 843,000 gallons bill of the Enbridge pipeline. That was all an oil sands product that came out of there. That was a dill bit that came out. Um, and there have been some other spills over on the west coast up in Canada. So what happens to this stuff? All right, when it comes out into the air, the first thing that happens is evaporation. That happens in any spill, all right? So the diluents, which are typically light things, they go and evaporate really fast, all right? So that stuff's going to evaporate off. What can happen is if it gets into water, it can form emulsions. This stuff forms uh, emulsions. Now you may say, well, what's an emulsion? If you take oil, like salad oil, and you shake it up with water, okay, or even vinegar, it kind of makes lots of little droplets, right? You keep shaking and shaking and shaking, and eventually it won't come apart, okay? That's an emulsion, all right? And so this stuff tends to form emulsions pretty quickly. That's very difficult to deal with. Uh, we had a lot of emulsions forming in the deep water horizon, and they're a pain in the butt because they're really sticky and they stick to everything. It can sorb. This stuff likes to stick to soil and sediment. So it can stick. It, especially once all that vap uh, stuff is, the lighter fractions have evaporated off, the diluents have evaporated off. Some of it can dissolve into water, but not very much. One of the things we didn't realize, but now seems to be a key, and there's a lot of research going on on this, is that this stuff tends to degrade in sunlight. And it degrades in a really weird way. And I'm going to show you some pictures. And it also can be degraded by microorganisms, but at very, very slow rates, because it's really heavy, and they don't like to eat it. So here's the photo degradation. These are pictures of what it looked like uh, with the material in the Enbridge spill. You see how this, this looks like just your regular kind of bitumen material. But see how it has this skin on it? When it gets exposed to sunlight, this bitumen, this diluted bitumen stuff that's, that uh, came out of the Enbridge pipeline, started to form a crust on it. And you can think of this as almost like, uh, have any of you ever had a lint chocolate? Yes. But it's a hard chocolate cr crust, yeah, right? And inside is kind of a gooey, tasty center. Yum, yum. Think of that in bitumen. OK? So inside is this oil sands product that's weathered because the evaporated stuff has gone off. And it has this skin. The sun makes the skin on it. And we don't understand why, but that's what appears to happen. Now, you might say, oh, and here's a little ball of it with the skin on it. And you might say, well, what, what, why the heck would you care about that? Well, let me, uh, we talked about this. Let me talk about one other characteristic. Remember I said it likes to stick to things? If you have sediment in the water, right, when the Enbridge spill ha happened, there had been a big flood, which is why the pipeline failed, because the pipeline failed from the outside wasn't being properly supported, so the pipeline broke. So the Kalamazoo River had gone over its banks, and when a river floods, there's lots of sediment, right? So what happened was this bitumen stuck to the sediment, all right? So all this bitumen was stuck with little sediment particles, and what do you think it did? It sunk, right? And it sunk in little lint chocolate balls. OK? Bitumen is right, the bitumen is okay. right on the border of being able to sink below the surface. So it you give it a little sediment, earth and it goes you give it a little bottom. sediment, and doom. Mm -hmm. And once it sticks to the bottom, I have a big tank down in Durham where we put bitumen on the bottom of the tank. And once it sticks to something, it's going to stay there. And we can turn on a lot of water power 
and it takes a long time for it to break off, and it breaks off. Um, so it, it comes off, and it starts to pull back and pull back off the, off the bottom, right? And then a little head comes off, and a little tail just like taffy, like pulling taffy, and then it goes brrrf, up into the water and speeds along. And eventually, if the current is low enough, it'll make it up to the surface. Otherwise, it'll stay down below. So this stuff can be really, really a pain in the neck to clean up. Not only that, what happened when they wanted to clean up in the Kalamazoo River is they started to you know, try to get this stuff off the bottom. And as they did disturbing of the bottom, the skin on the little lint chocolate balls broke. And when the skin broke, the stuff popped to the surface, <laughs> only to form new skin and sink to the bottom. So it's, it's, uh, there's still lots and lots of stuff in Kalamazoo River. Well, you can't leave it there because it's heading towards the lake where the city of Kalamazoo gets its water supply. Yes. So the bottom line is we're in a big honking learning phase here. We don't know very much about how to deal with this stuff. Um, and so a lot of research is going on, primarily in Canada, some in the US now. Uh, to think about how this material evaporates. That can be issues for public safety. It can be issues for responders. How does it submerge? When does it submerge? How does it move along the bottom if it does submerge or if it submerges partially in the water? What makes it resuspend? What makes it remobilize up into the water? We don't know much about its toxicity to biota. We know very, very little about that. And we don't know how long it sticks around in the environment, but probably a long, long time. Yeah, didn't I give you the slides the last time too? Yeah, even though they're from New Hampshire, from wildcat country. <laughs> well, 